to live with Dr. McDougall, the live webinars that Dr. McDougall presents every Thursday. I'm Gustavo Tolosa, and today uh, Dr. McDougall is talking about uh, diabetes and next Thursday as well. And um, I want to thank you, Dr. McDougall, welcome you, and how are you today? Oh, good, good, cold. We finally got some cold weather in California. So I have a sweater on today. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it. Uh, today is also kind of a landmark. If you look at uh, the newspaper today, they uh -huh. say that uh, uh, in America, the obesity rate is now 38%. Oh, 38%. yes, I saw that. Yes. And, and they were talking about how it was 32% like last year and for the last few years and uh, bragging about now we finally got the obesity epidemic under control because it's not rising anymore. Right. Well, it is. It went up from 32% to 38%, and it's going to keep rising. I mean, they predict that in uh, some parts of the country, uh, like in uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, that the obesity rates by 2030 will be around 60%, 70% of the people will be obese at this rate. Well, obviously, moderation is not working, right? Moderation is not working. I mean, as hard as people are trying, you know, they're trying to, uh, uh, to not eat. Uh, they're going on all these uh, unhealthy diets, these uh, uh, ketosis producing diets like the Atkins right. diet, the wheat belly diet, and the grain brain diet, limiting carbohydrates, uh, obviously it's not working. So uh, oh, two, oh, this obesity epidemic is tied type 2 diabetes. I mean, they're like equal. Right. <laughs> That's how you get, uh, we'll get into that in a few minutes, how you get type 2 diabetes. But uh, as the obesity rate goes up, so does the diabetes rate. Uh, there was an announcement recently that the U.S. has gone up to about about 14% uh, of the people are now diabetic, uh, and uh, over or about half are pre-diabetic, and th there are similar rates to that in places like China. Uh, two years ago, they announced that in China, 12% of the population was uh, diabetic, and half were pre-diabetic. India, similar, all over the world. So this is not just an obesity epidemic and type 2 diabetes epidemic that's hitting America, the United States. Uh, it's an epidemic that's spread uh, wherever wealth has spread, wherever be people become rich and rich enough to eat like kings and queens, they get, they get fat. And uh, with the fatness comes insulin resistance, and with this insulin resistance comes uh, elevated blood sugars, and then we call that type 2 diabetes. Uh, the, problem, the, problem, uh, the problem with solving the problem is that people have a, a terrible misunderstanding about uh, the importance uh, and the role of carbohydrate, sugar. Uh, carbohydrate starch, uh, carbohydrate potatoes, rice, corn. Uh, people believe that carbohydrates, even white sugar, they believe that uh, uh, that this component, energy-giving component of the food, results in diabetes because obviously the food is sugar, and obviously what we're looking at in the blood is elevated sugar. So they, you know, match uh, the sugar in the food with sugar in the blood. But that's just not the case. That's not how it works. Your blood sugar does go up after you eat because it's supposed to. I mean, that's why you eat to get calories. Uh, but uh, sugar actually, as I'll show you in just a minute, uh, uh, sugar is really kind to the body, even white sugar in terms of uh, insulin uh, uh, sufficiency, how efficient insulin works. It works better in a sugar environment. And it, get, it gets paralyzed by consuming fat. And uh, we'll go over that in, in a couple of minutes. But people, if you're going to get your problem solved, and I say this every time we get together, if you're going to get your problem solved, you must get uh, one serious misunderstanding straightened out, and that is that carbohydrate is bad for you. Now, as I've said before, and I'll repeat, and I'll repeat again, uh, white sugar is not health food. White sugar will rot your teeth. It's empty calories. Uh, it will raise your triglycerides if you're sensitive to uh, elevated triglycerides. So I'm not talking about white sugar being health food, but white sugar does not cause diabetes, and I'll show you the evidence on that in just a minute. Uh, the kind of sugars that I recommend and feed to people in terms of the, the broad-based diet is starch, rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. And until you get that uh, basic concept uh, uh, in your mind that starch is good for you, uh, it uh, cures diabetes, it uh, cures heart disease, it cures constipation. I'm talking about rice, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans, peas, lentils. That's what I'm talking about. Then you're basically out of control. You, you, you cannot solve your problems when you have such a fundamental message uh, that's incorrect. If you believe that starch is bad for you, starch is fattening, 
you're not going to get it fixed. And you can prove it to yourself that starch isn't fattening just very easily by opening your eyes and looking at a little bit of history. A little bit of history it could go back uh, 20, 30 years. You look at the fact that uh, people who ate a lot of starch, for example, I, we talked about the Chinese now having 12% of the population with type 2 diabetes. Uh, if you go back 35 years to 1980, fewer than 1% had type 2 diabetes. And if you remember the time, and it's still the kind of this way in Asia, uh, when you would uh, typically look at people from Vietnam or Cambodia or Japan or China, there were no fat people. And 90% of their diet was rice. It was white rice, by the way, which is, uh, you know, it's not as good as brown rice, but white rice is not a deal maker. So yeah, that, that concept has to be uh, fixed in people's minds. I think what I'd like to do is uh, just talk to you a little bit about diabetes and uh, we'll, as you say, continue the conversation next week and maybe get more clarification. Some of the things maybe I haven't made absolutely clear, people can ask me questions about. But uh, diabetes essentially means elevated uh, blood sugar. The blood sugar is up. Uh, it got, goes up uh, by two main mechanisms uh, and they're very different. Uh, but one mechanism that the blood sugar group goes up is a condition called type 1 diabetes, type 1. Or they used to call it childhood diabetes because it was the most common kind in children, but nowadays the children are so fat uh, that they get type 2 diabetes. So it's a better to, uh, it's better, or it's better to just call it type 1 diabetes. About uh, half the people who get type 1 diabetes are over the age of 18 when they get it. So it's not really childhood diabetes. So we're going to call it type 1 diabetes, and it's a condition of extreme insulin deficiency. Uh, insulin's made in the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas gets damaged. Uh, the beta cells which make the insulin, uh, they're destroyed. And as a result, the body doesn't make insulin and the blood sugar goes up. This is a very serious condition. People die of this condition. They get very sick. They always need insulin supplementation. They need to take insulin always if they have this condition. Uh, what causes the, the destruction of the beta cells uh, in the pancreas, the insulin producing cells? Uh, it's caused by an autoimmune reaction where the body attacks itself. The body attacks itself. Now, why would the body attack the pancreas? Uh, the cause, I believe, and the research is extensive in proving this, uh, is this is an autoimmune reaction where the body uh, reacts to cow's milk, cow's milk protein. Uh, beta casein specifically, specifically 17 amino acids on the beta casein molecule have been identified and published in research. Uh, I don't have it right up here at the moment to show you, but it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, I believe in 1992. They showed where uh, uh, cow's milk protein goes into the bloodstream. The body recognizes this uh, particular protein as being foreign, so it makes antibodies to the cow's milk protein and these antibodies, they not only uh, look for and attack the cow milk protein, which is not supposed to be in the bloodstream. Cow milk protein is not supposed to be in the bloodstream. Uh, they find similar uh, segments of amino acids. These seven, 17 amino acids, they find them on the surface of the beta cells. So while the antibodies that are produced against the foreign cow milk protein are, are looking for the cow milk protein, they also run, run across the pancreas and the beta cells in the pancreas, and they find these seven, same 17 amino acids and they uh, attach to these amino acids and destroy the beta cells. It takes, oh, it takes maybe three to five years on average to destroy a, a pancreas, but it can happen faster or slower. So that's how you get type one diabetes. Uh, always requires insulin for treatment, but it's extremely important a type one diabetic uh, follows a good diet because they have a very high risk of complications like uh, blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, even cancer. Uh, they need to follow a healthy diet, plus they need to take insulin. And I'll just add one quick note here, which probably deserves more explanation. But uh, when I take care of people with type 1 diabetes who come to my clinic who are on insulin or the insulin pump or shots, uh, I generally reduce their insulin by 30% so that they don't have low blood sugar reactions. So uh, when they change their diet, the, uh, the insulin dose they're taking is uh, two-thirds, 70% of uh, what it used to be. So, Good. Dr. Dr. Matugo, um, can you clarify for people that may be new to the webinars um, how you, you're saying starch, uh, but you're also saying no oil, no butter, no cheese.
just yes. a pure starch, starch right? right. Uh, well, you know, actually, uh, diabetics can have uh, some simple sugars, but no, they can't have the butter. They can't have the meat. I mean, these are the things that give uh, people heart attacks and cancer and uh, you know other diseases that don't have diabetes. You take a person with di with type one diabetes, uh, they they have uh, impairment in the function of their uh, whole system. As a result, they can't defend and repair your damage as efficiently as somebody without diabetes. So uh, a type one diabetic, if uh, they get an infection in their foot, they could uh, easily g develop gangrene. Whereas you and I, if we get an infection in our foot, it's usually no big deal uh, because we have a, 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 an immune system, an entire body system that can defend and repair uh, from damage from damages. Well, if you feed the Western diet, which gives people heart attacks and uh, You know cancer and all, all kinds of eye damage all kinds of problems you feed that Western diet to a diabetic Who has this impairment this metabolic impairment? They fall apart much faster. So your type 1 diabetics definitely need to eat well, too So I, if we could just drop type 1 diabetes for a minute, uh, we won't We won't be able to get into type 2 diabetes uh, type 2 diabetes uh, is a completely different situation, except for the fact that the blood sugar is up. In a type 2 diabetic, uh, uh, the person makes as much insulin as somebody without diabetes. What has happened in type 2 diabetes is uh, the person has consumed uh, an excess amount of calories and has become overweight as a consequence. They become fat. Now, consuming extra calories is an important thing to do, uh, to get ready for winter time for a famine. You want to put on a little bit of fat. That's a survival benefit for people, particularly in, in leaner times of the past. So you put on a little bit of fat, and that's good. That gets you able to get through a, a lean, lean winter or other lean times. But if you start putting on more than that uh, fat that you need for survival, say you, instead of just gaining 30 pounds, getting ready for winter, say you gain 60 or 80 pounds. Uh, then it becomes a survival disadvantage to have that extra weight. Uh, back, back in the old times, you couldn't outrun out, 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 out the saber-toothed tiger. You couldn't uh, uh, get through the small cave opening uh, if you were that big, enormously big. So what the body does is for survival, and the body's always trying to survive. What the body does for survival is it, uh, uh, it develops uh, insulin resistance. Insulin pushes fat into fat cells. So, okay, you can gain 20, 30 pounds, that's good. When you start gaining 60, 70, 80 pounds, the body says, that's bad, that's not good for survival. So I'll make your insulin work less efficiently. You develop insulin resistance. And so you put less fat in the fat cells. Well, if the insulin becomes less efficient, not only do you put less fat into fat cells, but you also, uh, you also have the blood sugar go up from the insulin ins insufficiency. So that's how you develop type two diabetes. You've got uh, plenty of insulin all, all around, as I say, as much as a normal person, or sometimes twice as much. It's just the insulin doesn't work efficiently, and that's for the survival benefit of keeping you from becoming two, three, four, five hundred pounds. Uh, research on um, on the cause of type two diabetes began many, many years ago. Uh, one of my favorite studies, and maybe I can go to this, was a study done by Shirley Sweeney back in 1927. Uh, Shirley Sweeney took his medical students and he fed them a, uh, 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 several types of diets. Now, I'm going to have to show you. This is a paper that I have that's actually on the website, which who, people who um, take the uh, START certification course or take the CME doctor course, they can go to this, uh, uh, to this section of the website and they can find all of these papers. I put them up as PDF files. So let's, let me show you one of my favorite old studies. It's by Shirley Sweeney and his medical students. What Shirley Sweeney did is he took his medical students and he uh, fed them for two days various kinds of diets and saw what their blood sugar levels were uh, during that period of time. And you can see each one of these lines here represents the blood sugar level. And uh, Shirley Sweeney fed them a diet of candy and sugar and you know, really junk, junk carbohydrates, very, very high carbohydrate diet. And you can see the blood sugar levels there. I don't know whether you can see my pointer or not, but uh, you see the blood sugar levels go up to maybe 140 or so. And this is over a, a period of time of uh, 
uh, of a couple of, well, 120, 100, uh, to about two hours after you eat. You see how the blood sugar levels go up? They just go up a little bit like they're supposed to when you eat. Uh, that's why you eat, is to raise your blood sugar. Well, Shirley Sweeney did that with sugar, and then in another phase of the diet, he took these uh, same students and he fed them a diet high in fat. Now, these are normal, healthy students. This is the high fat diet. And you see the charts here. You see what happens to their blood sugar when here they are fed uh, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, um, excuse me, they're fed uh, a, a lot of fat. And this is when they're fed the fat, and then you watch their blood sugar immediately go up. What happened to all of the students, this was a very high fat diet, is all of the students became diabetic after feeding them a high fat diet. I was done in 1927. A uh, very, um, uh, very important basic research that uh, was done, you know, long, long time ago. Uh, let me just, just see if I can go to another interesting paper. This is a, uh, well, let me go here. We got all the, all the, all the things working. Just tell me, uh, Gustavo, if things are not working as I plan. Yes, they're, they're working, working just fine. Oh. Well, we have to we have to find a stop. Are you, do you see me now, or I can see you? But now I'm going to put myself on the screen while you work on the oh, computer. Right. Well, and uh, uh, now here I got the screen share now. Very good. All here's, right. Here's a study done by uh, Hemsworth. Hemsworth was one of the most uh, most important doctors in diabetic research. This study was published in 1940 in the British Medical Journal. And what he did is he fed people either uh, either sugar or fat and saw what happened, a uh, high fat diet or a high carbohydrate diet. You see the graph there. And when he fed people a high fat diet, their blood sugars went very, very high. And when he fed them a high sugar diet, their blood sugars stayed low. This paper published in 1940 should have saw, settled forever the debate as to what causes type two diabetes. It's the fat that paralyzes the insulin that causes the blood sugar to go up. Now, let me see if I can go to just one final paper I wanted to show you. And, and I could show you many, many papers. Now, let me try again get this one up. Uh, this is, um, this is a, a study by uh, a fellow named Brunzel. Uh, uh, some reason I'm not getting this. Why don't you go back to your screen so I can get the, see if I can get the screen share up. Right. Right. While you're, while you're looking for those later, I want okay, to... Okay, I got it. I think when you're connected and I'm connected at the same time, it doesn't seem to work out. Okay. This okay. is, this is okay. a study. Uh, do you see this uh, a, a paper by yeah. Brunzel? Okay, this was published by Brunzel in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1971. And what he did is he took type 2 diabetics and he fed them a diet of 45% uh, sugar. It was a, 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 a diet that they made up. It was a, a multi-dextrose uh, uh, formula with simple sugars. And he fed them a diet of 45% sugar, and then he doubled the sugar intake to 85% of the calories. And every aspect of the type 2 diabetes improved. Their fasting blood sugars, their 24-hour blood sugars, uh, everything about their diabetes improved by, um, by increasing the amount of sugar in the diet. Now, Every doctor should know this. Uh, every, everybody who sees this paper and understands it realizes that sugar doesn't make diabetes worse. It actually makes diabetes better in a sense. And if you see the concluding sentence there, the one that I have the X and the, and the line by, it says these data suggest that a high carbo diet increased the sensitivity of peripheral tissues to insulin. In other words, the sugar make, made the insulin more efficient and work better. And then there's another paper that I could have and should have pulled up for you. It was published in Diabetes Care. And there are several of these papers. If you go to PubMed and you start reading research, you'll find lots of papers that show you that protein and fat paralyzes insulin activity. Uh, this paper that I'm thinking about in uh, Diabetes Care was published a couple of years ago. They took type 1 diabetics and they uh, increased the fat in their diet and they found that their uh, diabetes worsened. So let me just kind of summarize here, and then we can go to questions. Uh, the important thing to understand is that um, we know what causes type 2 diabetes, and that is uh, uh, the high-fat Western diet. It's, it's not the sugar. It's not the carbohydrate. And, and then the obesity that follows causes type 2 diabetes. 
And we need to fix that by feeding people a high carbohydrate diet, a starch-based diet. And then what happens is they lose the weight. The insulin works more efficiently when you get the fat out and the sugar in, the carbohydrate in. And uh, as a result, people are cured. Uh, the cure rate of type 2 diabetes is 100%. 100% of people with type 2 diabetes are cured with a change of diet and associated weight loss. Now, I do have to say one more thing before I uh, turn it into questions, is that there is type 1 diabetes that I talked to you about where no insulin is produced by the pancreas, or very little. And then there's type 2 where the pancreas produces loads of insulin. It's just the insulin doesn't work because of insulin resistance that develops to protect the body. In between type 1 and type 2, there's something that I call type 1 and a half. This is partial pan pancreatic insufficiency. You make enough insulin to keep you from going into ketoacidosis and dying, but you don't make enough insulin to uh, keep your blood sugar normal. And for those people with type 1 and a half diabetes, if they lose too much weight, develop symptoms of diabetes, or they worry about their numbers, I put them on some long-acting insulin. I use Lantus usually, long-acting insulin, to keep them from losing too much weight, to keep them safe from having excessive urination, or to keep them psychologically more comfortable because their numbers are better. I think that's a, a probably enough to introduce this, the topic. And Very good, yes. That is a wonderful, thank you, Dr. Mandula. My, one of my, what, what, as you're presenting this, my question is, where are doctors getting their information today if there are these articles out there and we still have a doctor saying, don't eat sugar, don't eat starches? Well, you know, doctors unfortunately get virtually no information about nutrition in uh, their medical training, so they just don't know. Uh, if they read the research, understood the research, <coughs> excuse me, if they, uh, uh, they knew the work of, uh, of, say, James Anderson from University of Kentucky, where he was taking type 2 diabetics and getting essentially all of them off their diabetic pills and about two-thirds of them off their insulin type 2 diabetics, or, you know, there, there are all kinds of studies that have, have been done and are published. And essentially, there's, there's nothing to the contrary. It's, I, don't, I, I have to say, it probably still goes back to industry, what industry wants the dietitians and the doctors to know. I mean, the, the, the dairy industry, the uh, uh, soda pop industry, the you know, sugary beverage industries, the right. pork industry, the beef industry, they put on the conferences for uh, the dietitians. Uh, they pay for the uh, medical journal articles that are published in the uh, nutrition journals and other medical journals. So it's a matter of information control. Uh, it's, it's money talking. It's not a conspiracy. It's just that uh, there's, uh, there's no money in condemning their products and saying, well, if you eat meat, you have more chance of getting diabetes. If you, if you use olive oil, you have more chance of getting diabetes. There's just, they're not going to tell you that because it's not in their business interests. Right, right. Dr. McDougall, Susan is asking, uh, what do you think of metformin? Well, uh, metformin is something that I, that I use, or, excuse me, I rarely use. Uh, it is probably the safest of the, uh, let me put it another way, it's the least dangerous of the diabetic pills. I will not prescribe any of the diabetic pills the sulfonylureas, uh, the various medications. There are a whole slew of them out there now. And all of these diabetic pills have horrible complications, including increasing the risk of dying. Uh, so I, I don't prescribe any of the pills. Uh, metformin, on occasion, I get talked into prescribing it by a patient on occasion, maybe once or twice a year, because they don't want to take the insulin, and they want to try it, they want it to stay on a pill. And I, I'll say, okay, I don't think it's really in your best interest. These would be people with type one and a half diabetes. I think you should go on a little long-acting insulin like Lantus. So, uh, you know, it's, it's not my drug of choice. I wouldn't, uh, uh, you won't find me prescribing metformin you will, often, and you will never see me prescribing the other diabetic pills. But you will see me prescribing uh, long-acting insulin like Lantus uh, in the cases I said. Uh, but which gives me a chance to, I think maybe we should talk about this next week if you can remind, remind me. But... Uh, Treating diabetes has been tested in six major studies as to whether or not it benefits people by treating diabetics aggressively or not aggressively. And uh, these uh, six studies are, you can find in an article I published on uh, diabetes in 
2009. You just go to my newsletter, look under Hot Topics Diabetes, and then there's an article called uh, The Easy Treatment of Diabetes, something like that. And these studies are cited. You can read them yourself. All six studies show great harm in uh, uh, treating diabetics aggressively. And the last three studies published, and they'll be the last three that are ever published, they were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in the year 2008. They're the Accord, the Advance, and the Veteran Study. And all three of these studies uh, show that when you aggressively treat people with type 2 diabetes, uh, aggressively treat, treat, treating, uh, the, their, their criterion was a hemoglobin A1C of 6% uh, versus casual treatment where the hemoglobin A1C was around 8%. When they aggressively treated type 2 diabetics with multiple shots of insulin, multiple pills, multiple times testing blood sugar during the day, uh, they increased the risk of death, heart disease, uh, uh, sudden death, various problems. In fact, the National Heart, uh, Lung, and Blood Institute, they stopped the Accord study 17 months early because of an increased risk of death and heart disease shown uh, by aggressively treating type 2 diabetes. So it's not just that these pills uh, are, uh, you know, I, I, well, let me just say it clearly, these pills are dangerous. Uh, uh, the pills themselves are, and when you use them in an aggressive manner, they're even more dangerous, and including insulin, when you aggressively treat a type 2 diabetic uh, with insulin. Uh, be careful because you're introducing more heart disease, more death, uh, more hypoglycemia, which is a real problem. The blood sugar becomes too low, and it's so low that uh, you might get picked up uh, by the police for a, a DUI. Or, or you might fall down, it becomes very dangerous. And all the research shows that, that aggressive treatment is dangerous. So, you know, you got to be careful. Uh, right. Everybody wants to get their blood sugar normal. Yes, well, if you get it normal with these drugs, you're going to likely get into big trouble. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Dr. Bagtugal, uh, we, a lot of people have the image of people who are overweight having diabetes, but what about people that are thin, how do thin people get diabetes? Well, this is type 1 diabetes. The type 1 diabetics are thin. Uh, type 2 diabetes is uh, synonymous with being overweight or obesity. You don't see, I mean, when you get fat, you develop insulin resistance, you get type 2 diabetes. They go together, the being overweight, obese, and having type 2 diabetes. A trim person who has diabetes either has type 1 and a half diabetes or has type 1 diabetes. And they usually need uh, insulin supplementation. They need a shot of Lantus in the evening to keep them from becoming too thin or even dying, as I said. They need insulin supplementation. All right, Dr. Maktugo, there is a physician here who's asking, um, let me see here. Would you, um, would you ask Dr. Maktugo what blood tests I should do immediately when I put a diabetic patient on his program? And how do I know when my patient no longer has diabetes? Okay. Well, this is the way I do it. Now, we're assuming we're talking about type 1 and a half or type 2 diabetes, not type 1. Remember I said with type 1, what you do is you drop the insulin dose by about a third. Yeah. And then what you do is you, you monitor the patient uh, uh, every, say, once a day in the morning is good enough. And you adjust the insulin dose based on, say, their fasting blood sugar. I, I have a goal of around 150 milligrams per deciliter as a fasting blood sugar and not lower because I don't want them to go into hypoglycemia. It's just way too dangerous. So you drop the insulin by a third, 30% a third, and uh, uh, continue the type 1 patient on, di on uh, insulin and you check their blood sugar or have them check them themselves in the morning and just vary the dose of insulin uh, based upon the sugar levels. Not too low, but then again, you know, when you get them really high, people worry. And as far as a type 2 diabetic, if I'm confident a person has type 2 diabetes, or at least uh, uh, they don't have a lot of insulin uh, insufficiency and their pancreas isn't severely damaged, uh, people come to see me in my program where I'm the doctor. And uh, the first day they arrive at the program, what I tell them is I tell them to stop all their medication. I stop all the medication, all the pills for the patients who come in to my program who have diabetes. Because I know they're a type 2 diabetic if they're on pills, or at least a, a type 1 and a half. So I stop all of their pills. Uh, if, I, if I believe they're a type 2 diabetic, and I do that based on experience and guessing. 
Uh, the person comes in, they're very overweight. They tell me about their blood sugar levels. They haven't been extreme. They give me no history that would suggest they had uh, severe pancreatic insufficiency. And I'm pretty confident they're making some insulin themselves, at least enough. What I do is I tell them to stop their medication. I stop their insulin. I've stopped people. People have been ta taking 150 units of insulin. I, I think I, we even had a uh, fellow a couple of programs ago that was taking 300 units of insulin. Now, he eventually ended up taking some insulin, but uh, I stopped all the insulin on him the first day. Uh, I stopped all the diabetic pills for every patient uh, who I'm confident makes a, enough uh, insulin in their pancreas. And, and they would, they have to, otherwise they wouldn't be on the pills. So you stop the medication for a type 2 diabetic, you check their blood sugar the next morning, uh, see what happens. Uh, if, if, uh, if you're worried about the blood sugar, that's one of the criteria I, criteria I use to decide whether or not to add some insulin to the patient's program. If, if you're worried about the uh, blood sugar level, say it's 400, 500, you say, well, you know, this, this even worries me as a doctor. I'll put them on a little bit of long-acting insulin. Or if they develop symptoms of diabetes, such as excessive urination, you might put them on a little long-acting insulin. Uh, if they lose too much weight, which is something I don't see within seven days, but say three months, three years down the line, they're, uh, they're really, really thin. They've got to be... Uh, they have to have significant insufficiency of the pancreas in terms of insulin production, and they need to have that extra insulin to keep their weight on. Okay? Because insulin allows sugar to go into your regular cells and allows fat to go into your fat cells. So you, that, anyway, I hope right. that's sufficient. Right. Uh, could you tell us, Dr. McDougall, a little bit about all the resources that you have in your website so that if people that didn't get your question answered today, they can go and see that on your website. Well, the way I would approach this, uh, if, if we've got your interest or you really want to learn more about it, is go on my website uh, to education, uh, then uh, go to the hot topics. And there's a hot topic on diabetes. And uh, in fact, maybe I, I don't know whether I can go there for you or not, but that might be the best thing to do. <clears throat> Give me a second here and see if I can do this for you. Uh, right. Uh, uh, let's see. You know, there's something else I have to do, and that is I fa uh, failed to uh, get the power supply connected. Could, could you take me off screen for just a second? Sure, sure. No problem. Okay. Yeah, we're right, we're going to run out of battery and have some real Would you turn off your microphone for a second? Uh, that way we won't. So, so you don't hear me screaming, Mary? Mary That's I, right. I'm power supply quickly. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, uh, uh, Thank you, everybody, for being here today. We're still continuing a little bit. Dr. McDougall has to go and plug the computer so that he doesn't run out of power. And um, I have uh, the questions that you send. I always uh, print them here. Uh, sometimes we run out of time, but uh, I keep them for future webinars. And next week, we are doing, um, Dr. McDougall is doing another webinar on um, diabetes. So hopefully any other questions that you have will be answered. And um, I think we're back. Okay, now. we are back. We have power. All right. <laughs> Very good. So on. Um, um, Dr. McDougall, uh, so the, the, uh, someone is asking about using natural sweet, sweeteners. So basically you were saying earlier that it, don't worry too much about sugar. Well, sugar provides, uh, it provides calories. So it's not, you know, if you eat the sugar, if you eat sugar, the body's going to burn the sugar and leave the fat in your body fat. So it's going to discourage weight loss. Uh, the sugar, as I said, is going to rot your teeth. It's uh, largely empty calories, but it's not going to make diabetes worse and it's not going to have the impact that you think it has. You know, the, the idea that everybody's heard it. Uh, don't eat sugar. Sugar turns to fat and makes you fat. Uh, don't eat starch, don't eat rice. Rice turns to uh, sugar, which uh, turns to fat, which makes you fat. I mean, just stop and think about rice eaters. I mean, that's where we started this conversation a few minutes ago, is think about rice eaters, like mm -hmm. Chinese, Japanese, uh, people from Vietnam. Uh, they eat 90% of their diet as rice, or used to, 35 years ago. Now, that's all changed as the people in that part of the world are now becoming very wealthy. I mean, the Chinese are becoming some of the wealthiest people on the planet, and it shows. Uh, the Chinese are becoming very fat, very sick. 
just like uh, the rest of the world that is giving up the starch and instead uh, eating the meat and the oil and the chicken and the eggs and the cheese, the dairy industries, uh, they've gone to China and Asia, even though the, the, uh, the Asians have lactose intolerance at a very high rate. Uh, the dairy industry has still penetrated uh, China and Japan and convinced people uh, to eat a food that makes them sick, makes them sick with uh, lactose intolerance. You get diarrhea, gas, and so on, and, and uh, causes diabetes. All right. Uh, Dr. McDougall, what, what do you think about uh, getting the shingles shot for a diabetic who is over 60 years of age? I, 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 would, rather, uh, I would rather not comment on things that I don't know a lot about. But I, I can just tell you that I, I'm a believer in immunizations except for flu vaccines. Uh, we can, in fact, we should do a show on, on uh, uh -huh. uh, flu shots. Uh, there's a newsletter I did last year on flu shots, and that's one immunization I don't recommend for people. But uh, other immunizations I do. Uh, all my, my children and grandchildren are fully immunized. And the only thing I can say about the shingles vaccine, since I, you know, I haven't studied it thoroughly, I don't feel like I'm a, uh, a person who can give you the data and the, the pluses and minuses. But I could just say that even though it cost me uh, over $300 a shot as a physician, I had to buy it. Uh, Mary and I both had the shingles, shingles vaccine uh, about three years ago. Uh, it was uh, my best personal guess, uh, uh, but as a professional opinion, I, I, I would not uh, tell you one way or the other, but I do, right. think, I do think immunizations are, well, I know, I, you know there are three things that have changed the incidence of disease in the world, three things, and they're better sanitation, better nutrition and immunization. Those, those three things have changed the, the incidence of disease worldwide and, other, and nothing else has. Antibiotics haven't, uh, you know, all, all the other modern technology that you have out there is basically not reduced, uh, it has in individuals, but not in populations, uh, reduced their incidence of, uh, of disease. Right. So in your program that you do, uh, particularly the 10 day program, uh, the success rate that you have with diabetics is uh, hundred percent. Well, it, uh, the success rate we have with diabetics, uh, again, you have to define diabetics and you have to define success. If the first person is a type two diabetic, the success rate is hundred percent just by definition. Uh, you can, you can cure diabetes and that, this got a lot of publicity, a lot of publicity. It was about, about three years ago. Uh, studies, prominent ones that I remember in the New England Journal of Medicine were published on bariatric surgery, where they go in and they rearrange the intestine so that people lose weight. And what they found is that 80% of the people with type 2 diabetes who had bariatric surgery, 80% of them were essentially cured of their, of their type 2 diabetes just by doing this weight losing surgery. So any way that you can get somebody to lose weight you will cure type 2 diabetes. Let me, let me just have a little fun with you. There's some, lots of ways for people to lose weight, and there's lots of ways for uh, the, the, the professions to get into the cure diabetes business. For example, uh, you could wire people's teeth together. <laughs> they used to do that, dentists, so that, uh, so that they'd lose weight. So dentists can cure type 2 diabetes. Uh, oncologists, cancer doctors can cure type 2 diabetes by putting people on chemotherapy. Type 2 diabetes goes away because they get sick from the chemotherapy, lose weight, and cure type 2 diabetes. A uh, neurosurgeon could cure type 2 diabetes by doing a, a, a prefrontal lobotomy and, and decreasing the person's appetite so they lose weight. So uh, neurosurgeons could get into the business. Uh, general surgeons. General surgeons could cure type 2 diabetes by cu cutting people's lower extremities off so they can't get to the refrigerator. If you got no legs, you can't get to the refrigerator. <laughs> You lose weight, you cure type 2 diabetes. So there are lots of, I mean, yeah, anyway, uh, our way is, uh, is uh, sensible and effective and not only takes care of the type 2 diabetes, but also takes care of the constipation and the heart disease. And, you know, it, 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 because it fixes the problem. The problem is that people are sick because they're eating food poison. And all of you need to go to my website and look at the, uh, the, the section I have on food poisoning. You're being poisoned by animal foods and by vegetable oils. Uh, and to stop the animal foods and vegetable oils and instead to eat oatmeal for breakfast and hash brown potatoes and to have uh, bean soups and pea soups and lentil soups and 
uh, healthy veggie burgers for lunch, uh, to have bean burritos, uh, spaghetti and mar marinara sauce, uh, mushu vegetables over rice uh, for dinner. Uh, to cure type 2 diabetes that way is the right way to do it. Yes, it's delicious food, it's sustainable, and just to remind people that they can go to your website and actually get the recipes. Um, yeah, there probably, are probably 500 free recipes there. We, right. also, we also have a, 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 mobile cook, uh, a mobile app, Dr. McDougall's cookbook app, That's right. and people really like that. And Mary's, Mary's published about 3,000 recipes in her career. Uh, they we, are have, amazing. we have 12 books, I think 10 of them have recipes in them. So there are lots of recipes available, and you need to just find one or two things you like. You know, uh, we we are one of our common meals, and I, when I say common, I mean three, four, sometimes five times a week in the evening. We'll have uh, beans and rice and a little kale from the garden, and that's a, a common uh, common dish for us. You need to find something like, for example, we serve pea soup at the program. The pea soup is a knockout. I, I, I hope you remember that. Oh, and, yes, I do, and I'm making it right now. <laughs> if you want to, you can You can just make a great big pot of pea soup. Yes. And you can have that for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the extra other, other two meals that you eat. You can have that every day uh, for the next 60 years. It's a, your, your diet is it, – it, simplicity is best for many reasons. But if you don't like the idea of having a monotonous, uh, simple diet, then, as I said, Mary's published about 3,000 recipes. Right, right. It doesn't have to be complicated. It shouldn't be. And it doesn't have to take a lot of time because I know a lot of people don't have time and they think that this way of eating takes a lot of time and it's expensive and it's not. No, in fact, your food bill probably drops right. at least in half uh, when you eat this kind of food and you stop. And if you, if you eat out a lot, it really drops and it may, it may be drop 90% if you eat, get your meals eating out. So uh, it's... Uh, now, it's a, a very inexpensive way to eat, very simple, very tasty way to eat. It's, it's the best food that you'll ever consume. You know, find the recipes you like, add a little bit of salt, uh, a little simple sugar on the surface of the food, and it usually works well for most people. Some people can't do that, but most people can have a little, a little salt on the surface of the food, a little simple sugar on the surface of the food. It works out. Uh, I, again, and maybe this is, would be a, a good uh, point to end on is that, uh, is that uh, you have must get your your thinking rearranged uh, otherwise you don't have a chance you you have to understand that uh, the human being is designed to be a starch eater a starchitarian a starch of ore we always have been we always will be uh, people who get on this uh, aberrant diet uh, of kings and queens uh, the diet of, uh, of animal foods and oils and desserts and so on uh, they get fat and sick. It's it's the diet of kings and queens, of priests, priests and priestess. Uh, it's a uh, it, it, it's it's been throughout history. We've known when you eat that kind of food, you get fat, you get the gout. The difference now is that the whole world can't afford, and this is only going to be temporary. But the whole world can't afford and does eat a diet of king of kings and queens. They're doing it in China. They're doing it in India. They're doing it every place, and the results are the same. Just look around you. So if you'll just get back to the natural diet of people, which is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables, and you minimize your feasts, you minimize your feasts, whether well, there's a big feast coming up here uh, uh, next, this month, Thanksgiving, big feast. That, that big feast, that Thanksgiving meal is uh, the healthiest meal that people have all year. It's a low-fat meat, and they have potatoes and, and all kinds of vegetables, and dressing made of bread and and uh, that's that that's the big feast for the year but it happens to be the healthiest diet the healthiest me <laughs> meal most people eat right so, you know realize that uh, you can get better health and you can get it for, with no cost and you can do it on your own and if you're on medication you should have some doctor's supervision uh, uh, reducing the medications that that's uh, that's only that's of course a, a very uh, important sensible recommendation for me to give you to get your doctor to work with you. I know some of you won't be able to do that. Uh, some of you will take the trouble to learn the things that I've taught you and you will take uh, chances on your own. But you know, I as a professional have to tell you to get other professionals involved with you when you make these uh, significant changes and especially when you reduce uh, your medications or stop your medications. But uh, you know what? <laughs> there are lots of people who just get the message and move along in life. All right.
Well, thank you, Dr. Mark Tugel. I think we are going to uh, stop here and, right. and uh, continue next week, and I hope everybody will join us. Do you have any other uh, words of advice bec before we quit today? No, I, I probably have given just uh, <laughs> too many pearls of wisdom. <laughs> okay. A, a good idea to let it, uh, Yeah, I, I, I have words of advice. I think you should tell your friends and relatives to join us in these webinars. Yes. And to spend time on our website. Uh, essentially, everything is free on the website. The instructions, the recipes, the the articles I told you about about uh, about diabetes, the things I've written, uh, are essentially free. We have uh, other other things that we do, which of course can't be free, like taking you to Hawaii. We're going to Kauai on January 30th. You have to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not just your airline ticket, but you have to pay for that. Yeah, if you when you come to the 10-day program, uh, of course we have to charge you for that, and uh, we have weekends and get involved in some of the personal things that we do too. But essentially, you know, there's no reason for somebody to say, I can't do this because I can't afford it, or I can't buy Dr. McDougall's advice, it's free. You know, I can't afford the food, excuse me, the beans and rice and potatoes are really cheap. So there's, there's no excuse. So send your friends and relatives our way. Uh, it, doesn't, it shouldn't cost them anything, these webinars are free. Ah. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> Very good. What else can I say? It's kind of yes. No. Yeah. Please bring family, friends. Yeah. This is why Dr. McDougall is doing this webinars? Thank you again, Dr. McDougall, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye.